Behind William, the iron door emitted a shrill, grating sound. Startled by the noise, he involuntarily flinched and turned around. For a moment, he stood still, gazing at the closed gates. Then, in confusion, he turned back. It was all over. Freedom. After five years in prison, he had forgotten what life on the outside was like. But now he had to start all over again. William took a deep breath of the fresh air. Yes, even the air here was different and delicious. He slung his backpack over his shoulder and slowly made his way to the bus stop, which was about a hundred meters from the prison fence. The old bus didn't keep him waiting long. William was the only passenger on board. Leaning against the window, William lost himself in thought, reminiscing about the past. Five years ago, he had it all. A thriving business, a beautiful wife. He had met Emma at a college party. At the time, William was finishing his architecture degree. While Emma was studying law, both young and attractive, they came from different social backgrounds. William came from a humble family in a distant countryside, having made his own way to college and excelling academically, while his mother lived in the village. His father had passed away when William was in the 10th grade. For a long time, he had doubted whether he should pursue this degree. No, becoming an architect had been his dream. How could he leave his mother all alone, especially with her heart condition? But Susanna insisted. You need to go to college, son, she would say, seeing William off to the distant capital. And he did. William was one of the top students in his class. He lived in a dormitory and earned extra money by writing term papers for his fellow students. Emma, on the other hand, had never known want. Her father had a thriving construction business and her mother had taken up a chain of beauty salons for entertainment. Emma pursued her education simply because it wouldn't be proper for a wealthy young woman to be without a degree. Her father, Jeremy, had hoped she would eventually join the family business, but Emma was indifferent. Why should she work he her husband would provide for her? Emma's parents didn't immediately accept William. Even though he had a good profession, he was still seen as a pauper. However, Jeremy took a closer look at his future son-in-law, crunched some numbers, and realized that he couldn't find a better right-hand man for his business. William was intelligent. He wouldn't let him down. His mother, Shinola, had learned to go along with her husband. If that's what he decided, then so be it. In short, Emma's choice was eventually approved, and after William graduated, he became part of their family. William's status in their family didn't matter. He simply loved Emma sincerely and wholeheartedly. Even if she hadn't had any dowry, he would have followed her to the ends of the earth, and Emma looked at William with loving eyes. He was the best for her. Soon after their wedding, Jeremy hired William, and he never regretted it. William was a competent professional, and then Jeremy had to step away from business due to heart problems. Emma also worked with him, but for her, it was just a way to pass the time, and now, William had his own house, a car, and a bank account. He dreamed only of one thing, for their mansion with Emma to be filled with the laughter of children. But his wife was in no hurry to become a mother. William patiently waited. His mother, whom he had moved from the village to the city, never asked him about it directly, but sometimes she hinted that it was time for her to become a grandmother, and she might not live long enough to see it. Everything has its time. William would just smile. That evening, they were returning from a friend's house. William had been drinking, so his wife was driving. They were silent as they drove. It was getting dark, and raindrops started to fall. William dozed off in the passenger seat. Suddenly, there was a loud crash, a jolt, and his wife's scream. William, did I hit him? He heard her hysterical voice, and he instantly sobered up. Hit who? William stared anxiously at the car's rear window. Just pull over. I'm scared, his wife shouted and accelerated. Only a new shout from her husband brought her to her senses, and she obediently pulled over to the shoulder. William jumped out of the car and ran back along the road. About 500 meters away lay an elderly man on the road. How could he have appeared here, on this deserted road, in the woods, when the nearest town was several kilometers away? William noticed a basket that had fallen to the roadside. Mushrooms were scattered everywhere, clearly. He was a mushroom picker. William rushed to check for a pulse, and he froze in horror. The man was dead. William, a voice came from the darkness. His wife Emma approached closer, and she screamed in horror. 
Tell me it's just a dog or some other animal. Emma, it's not a dog, William said softly. You hit a person. We'll have to call the police. In an ambulance. Emma remembered, reaching for her phone. He doesn't need it anymore, William replied. Emma screamed again, then trembled and burst into tears. William rushed to her and hugged her. Don't worry so much, he said. The police will sort everything out. After all, he's at fault. Why did he jump in front of the car? He did jump, right? Emma nodded hesitantly. That's right. Besides, he wasn't wearing any reflective gear. You just couldn't see him. I think a lawyer can easily prove that you couldn't have avoided the collision. William, will I go to jail? Emma whispered. In the darkness, William saw her face, pale with fear. Of course not, William said, though less confidently. I'm definitely going to jail, Emma cried. William, I can't, I'm pregnant. Upon hearing her words, William's mouth dropped open in surprise. Then he held her even tighter. My dear, why didn't you tell me before? I only found out today, Emma sobbed. I wanted to tell you in a romantic setting at home. But now look at how things turned out. William, I'm afraid there will be investigations, questions. I'm a lawyer myself. I understand everything. They'll lock me up. I'm scared for our child. I could lose it because of all the stress. Emma, don't worry. Everything will be fine. William said firmly, shaking her by the shoulders. Do you hear me? Then remember this. I was the one driving. Emma gasped quietly at what she had heard, then hugged him tightly. My love, thank you. Yes, I understand everything. William, Dad will hire the best lawyer. William called the police himself. Then the investigation began. The police found that the car hadn't braked at the time of the collision. There was a significant amount of alcohol in William's blood, and the lawyer hired by Jeremy seemed to be lackluster in defending William. In the end, he received a five-year sentence in a minimum security prison. As the verdict was read in the courtroom, William looked at his mother, who had aged a lifetime over these days. Susanna was also looking at him, her tears flowing down her face. Emma was not present in court. Her lawyer provided a certificate stating that Emma was in the hospital with a threatened miscarriage. Jeremy was in court and sat with his head down. When they were taking William away, his mother suddenly screamed and rushed towards him, but the bailiffs did not let her get close. William watched as his mother turned pale, collapsed, and sank to the floor. He rushed towards her, but they restrained him and led him out of the courtroom. Call an ambulance. Call an ambulance. William shouted, but the bailiff replied callously. You should have thought about that when you got behind the wheel drunk. He was placed in a police van and taken away. It was only in prison that he learned that his mother had died. A heart attack. William cried out of helplessness. He wouldn't even get a chance to say goodbye to his mother, and he was the one responsible for it all. Yes. He had driven her to a heart attack. Emma wrote to him at first, and she even came to visit once. She was quiet and contemplative. Emma, I was told that the lawyer didn't file an appeal. Why? William asked. Jeremy promised to help me out. I don't know, I'll ask. Emma replied absent-mindedly, then gave him a resentful look. So, you're just sitting there thinking about yourself. You don't care about how I'm feeling. I do care, William exclaimed. Emma, I think about you all the time, and about mom. I couldn't save her. You didn't save our child. Emma replied sharply. You mean? William paled and stopped mid-sentence. That's right. I lost the baby because of you. Emma lowered her gaze, paused, and then raised her head. You're to blame for everything. Emma, William whispered. Why are you saying this? It's hard for me to hear this from you. You know how it all happened. Why are you like this? Don't worry. We'll have more children. Emma didn't respond, just shook her head and called for the guard. The guard was surprised that the visit was over already. There was still plenty of time, but Emma headed for the exit. That's how it went without even hugging her husband. She left, and William sat on his stool, realizing what had just happened. So, Emma had convinced herself that he was to blame, and William understood that there was no way to prove otherwise, and he didn't even intend to. Perhaps, after losing the baby, Emma had become embittered. Well, time would pass, and she would realize that she had been wrong. But a month later, William received notice that Emma had divorced him. He had no desire to live after such betrayal. Initially, 
He wanted to declare that he had misspoken and that Emma should be held accountable for her actions. But then the experienced inmates explained to him that it was all futile. The verdict had already taken legal effect and no one would want to reopen the case, especially considering that Emma's father would do everything to shield his daughter from accusations and trying to appeal would only add more time to William's sentence. He had already been given the minimum, so William resigned himself to his fate. Over these five years, not a word from Emma, not a single package. Jeremy had also forgotten about his faithful assistant. Colleagues and former classmates seemed to have vanished. William was left alone with his misfortune. There was no one left in his life, and he didn't even know where they buried his mother. William's soul had turned to stone, and he had gracefully accepted the trials that fate had in store for him. Yes, there were all sorts of things in prison, but William managed, survived, and now freedom. The bus jolted, and William was awakened from his memories. He looked around. This was his stop now. He needed to get to the railway station. He stopped at the door and tried to ask the driver and conductor for directions to the station, but they pretended to be engrossed in a conversation paying him no attention. William just shook his head. Yes, those two had made up their minds about him that he was a criminal. Well, to hell with them. Who knows what trials fate has in store for them. There was an old lady selling flowers at the bus stop. William approached her to ask about the station. William stepped onto the train heading for the station. On the train, William kept thinking, why was he going to Belgium? But on the other hand, where else could he go? There, he might have some former friends and colleagues. He was hurt by their silence. For five years, not a single word from anyone, no messages. But right now, emotions were the last thing on his mind. He needed to figure out how to move forward. Besides, he had his own place. No, not the mansion they used to live in. Back then, when he bought it, Jeremy had convinced him to put everything in Emma's name. And William had trusted Emma as much as he trusted himself but there was an apartment he bought for his mother. It's probably empty now. He'll settle in, take some time to relax, and then start looking for a job. He didn't have much money left. His accounts were empty. Back then, during the trial, all his assets had been frozen and then transferred to the relatives of the deceased old man, and he also needed to meet with Emma, just to look her in the eyes. In Belgium, William was a bit disoriented. In these five years, he had grown accustomed to the lack of noise and commotion. He sat in a park near the bus stop, collected his thoughts, and then headed to his mother's apartment. There was a brand new intercom at the door, and for some reason, his magnetic key didn't work. Indeed, a lot has changed over this time, William thought. He waited until one of the tenants came out of the building and followed them inside. Now he was at the right apartment on the fourth floor. William sighed with relief. Finally, he could rest catch his breath, and get some sleep. But even that didn't go smoothly. The key to the apartment door didn't fit either, but William persisted and kept trying it. Suddenly, the door swung open, revealing a grouchy, sleepy, bald man. Hey, what do you want? He asked in surprise, clenching his fists instinctively. Who are you? William replied, taking a step back. Me. The man sneered, now fully awake. I'm the owner and you, kid. Better leave before I call the police. This is my apartment, William exclaimed. I bought it for my mother seven years ago. I don't know what happened seven years ago, but for the past three years, this has been my apartment, the stranger replied. I bought it legally, and all the documents are in order. Can I see those documents? No, get out of here, or I'll call the police for sure. The man said, I'm William with disdain, and slammed the door shut. William rushed towards the intercom again, but stopped at the last moment. The man was right. If the police came, they might charge him with vandalism or even attempted theft. Right now, he felt utterly helpless. To everyone else, he was just a former convict. William descended the staircase, stood by the entrance for a moment, and then headed to the first floor. Fortunately, there was someone in the building who knew his mother. She should have information about all the residents. When Laura saw William, she waved her hands in astonishment. William, you've returned, she exclaimed. Returned, Laura, William replied somberly. I wanted to visit my mother's apartment, but there's a new owner there now. I don't understand how this could happen. 
The apartment was registered in my name. In your name. Laura looked puzzled. Oh, I didn't know how it happened. Emma simply sold your apartment. William, Laura said tearfully. How did this happen? Oh, what a tragedy. Your mother never believed till the end that you would end up in prison. She couldn't believe you were behind the wheel. You used to be such a careful driver. Laura, do you know where they buried my mother? I do. Oak Susanna, how sorry I feel for her. She wiped away a few tears, and William lowered his gaze. Memories of his mother were still a painful wound in his heart. So, they took my mother back to our homeland, probably buried her next to my father. At least they rest together, William mused. But as for Emma, it seemed she didn't want to be involved, even in his mother's burial arrangements. William still couldn't believe how his ex-wife had changed, considering that she had sworn her love and begged him to save her from prison. How quickly she had shifted blame onto him. William realized that he couldn't avoid a conversation with Emma. He needed to figure out everything about the apartment. He also just needed to look her in the eyes. Laura, I should go, he said wearily, turning towards the door. Where will you go? Laura suddenly snapped out of her thoughts. Let me at least make you some tea. Come, I'll tell you everything I know about the apartment sale. William still shook his head in disagreement, but Laura wasn't going to listen to him. She pulled him by the sleeve, sat him down at a small table, boiled the kettle, and brought some pastries. William listened to her account. After Susanna's death, the apartment remained empty for a while, and then suddenly, there was a lot of commotion surrounding it. Different people came and went. Laura saw Emma there a few times with an elderly man. Based on the description, it was Jeremy. Later, the belled man arrived, claiming to be the new owner of the apartment. He had all the proper documents. But I still think you should go to the police. Laura concluded her story. Let them investigate how your apartment ended up not being yours. Even though your father-in-law is a very influential person, proving the truth won't be easy. William simply nodded in response, realizing that Laura was right. As a former convict, he had no voice. Where are you staying? Laura suddenly remembered to ask. I have nowhere to stay. William admitted. I thought about my mother's apartment. Oh, what a disaster. Laura sighed, deep in thought. Listen, I can put you up for a few days in one place. We have a room for a janitor there. The room is there, but there's no janitor. You can stay there. Think about your next steps, and if you want, I can hire you as a janitor. Thank you, Laura. I want refuse a place to stay, but honestly, I don't want to work as a janitor. William replied, I understand, with your higher education, it wouldn't be right. But William, don't take offense, it'll be difficult for you to find a job in your field now. I'll try, he said with a sad smile, and if it's all right, I'll give you a definite answer a bit later. Laura agreed. She handed him the keys and led him to the place, showing him everything there. The room was small, windowless, dark, and stuffy, but it had a couch and a pillow. William collapsed onto his makeshift bed and slept for nearly a day. He woke up not knowing what time it was. He checked the clock, it was half past five in the morning. He played with the watch in his hands. Perhaps it was the only valuable item he had left. It had been a birthday gift from Emma. The pain of betrayal stabbed at his heart. William clenched the watch tightly, ready to throw it against the wall, but he paused. Put all these emotions aside. You need to think rationally, William told himself. The watch was valuable, but how much money did he have left in his pocket? Not more than a hundred dollars. William washed his face in a basin and straightened his clothes. That's all the preparation before heading outside, William said with a bitter smile. He used to be impeccably dressed, and now he was practically homeless. Well, not practically, but actually homeless. He thought about the apartment again. I still need to go to the police, he said to himself. He had to register with the local precinct. At the same time, William decided to inquire about the apartment. Where should he start unraveling this mess? Emma had deceived him, and she needed to be held accountable. At the police station, the elderly local officer briefly lectured William on proper behavior as a free man and made a note in his journal. All right, William, go and don't break the law anymore, he said, handing William back his passport. Aren't you going to ask where I'll be staying? William inquired. Why? Your passport has your registered address. 
The officer replied, surprised. Another person lives at that address now, and the apartment belongs to him. William explained the situation concisely. The officer listened, asked about his former father-in-law, and then left the room for a few minutes, leaving William alone. Soon, he returned, sat down at his desk, and sighed heavily. William, in short, you know who Jeremy is, and you probably know without me. The officer hesitated, avoiding eye contact with William. I will, of course, investigate the situation, but I can already tell you that you won't be able to reclaim the apartment. So, don't even try. Where are you living now? I'm staying in the basement, in the janitor's room. William replied, that's where you'll live for now. And being a janitor is a respectable job, the officer said. Quite prestigious. William chuckled sadly. All right, I understand. He got up, said his goodbyes, and headed for the door. Don't cause any trouble there. The officer called after him, or you'll be back behind bars in no time. William, without saying anything, closed the doors behind him. He left the police station and let out a heavy sigh. There was no help for him here. He had hoped for a little, but now it was nothing but disappointment. He sat down in a nearby park, contemplating his next steps. Well, he would work as a janitor, but first, he needed to meet with Emma and her father, the people he had once considered his family. William made his way to his former mansion and rang the doorbell. It seemed that nothing had changed here over the years. The same fence he had ordered, the same mailbox. A security guard opened the gate and gave William a scrutinizing look. Who do you need? He asked gruffly, his gaze fixed on William's figure. I'm looking for the owner, Emma. William replied, Emma. The guard raised an eyebrow in surprise. There's no one like that here. Listen, I'm her ex-husband. William protested, ex-husband. The guard skeptically frowned. Look, buddy, go away or I'll call the police. I personally bought this house. A frustrated William exclaimed, call the people who live here now. What other demands do you have? The guard sneered, having trouble up there. He slammed the door shut, leaving William standing at the gate, seething with anger. How could this be? He had been cast out of his former life and completely forgotten, used and discarded. Then he heard the sound of an engine. The car pulled up in front of the house, honked its horn. The gates opened and it drove into the yard. William saw Emma behind the wheel. She also spotted him. Her expression changed. She turned pale and looked away. The car came to a stop in the yard and the gates closed. William didn't rush towards the car. He just stood by the gate, not sure what he was waiting for. The gate opened and Emma stepped outside. Hello, she simply said. Hello, William replied. Didn't expect to see me, she asked. I actually knew you would show up, but when William said, trailing off, so you've been released. Emma spoke casually, as if she had encountered an old acquaintance, but she avoided looking into his eyes. Yes, I've been released, William replied quietly. Emma, I want you to explain everything to me. Why did you do this to me? I saved you, and you divorced me. Your father acted as if I never existed, as if I didn't help him elevate his business. Emma, you betrayed me. I wasn't allowed into the mansion that I bought, in the apartment. What right did you have to sell it? So many questions, Emma chuckled. You know what? What happened a long time ago is in the past and doesn't matter anymore. You have your life. I have mine. I divorced you. What did you expect? To be the wife of a criminal is not my status. My father has a respectable business, serious partners, and then there's a criminal. And did you forget who I went to prison for? William asked quietly and bitterly. For whom? Emma rolled her eyes. For yourself. You. William wanted to curse, but he barely held back his anger. Emotions were overwhelming him. Emma, I can't believe you've become like this. You were different. You loved me. You were expecting a child from me. A child? She laughed. My God, you're so naive and gullible. There was no child. How could there be no child? William asked, incredulous. Oh, like this? Emma said with a smirk, looking at him mockingly. William felt like his head was being pounded with a hammer. She had been deceiving him from the very beginning. If William hadn't thought that Emma was pregnant, would he have taken the blame for her crimes? Probably not. He would have done everything to get her released, but he wouldn't have taken on such a sin. 
Seeing that William appeared outwardly calm, Emma became even more audacious. She kept talking, laughing. From her story, William understood that her father hadn't really tried to get him out of prison back then, as he had hired a less than stellar lawyer. Why? Because they didn't want a man with a tarnished reputation in their company or family. It would have been uncomfortable in front of their partners. After William went to prison, he eventually returned to managing the company. But now, he could finally take a break. The business was in reliable hands. So, found yourself a new man? William asked. This man is the best. Emma replied. Do you ever worry about saying all this to me? I just got out of prison. William looked him in the eyes. You, Emma chuckled. You can't do anything. Besides, we're being watched, and if necessary, I'll get help. She nodded toward a surveillance camera attached to the gate. William simply shook his head. It was so painful and disgusting for him to see the woman he had once loved and who had betrayed him. Did you ever think that I might go to the police and report you? He asked. I'll tell them that you ran someone over and took my apartment. I'm not afraid, Emma replied, lifting her head. Who are you and who are we? You say the apartment is yours, but it was bought with my father's money. Yes, it's his business, and he allowed you to earn something. Why should this apartment sit idle? So, I sold it and had a nice vacation with the money. Everything you earned is mine. Don't you dare object. My dad will crush you to dust. But he's not immortal, and as far as I remember, he had heart problems. William remarked, Don't hold your breath. Dad underwent treatment at the best clinic in Europe and now he's perfectly healthy. All right, but tell me, I want to understand. Aren't you ashamed of how you treated me? What about my mother? I was told you didn't even bother with her funeral. Why should I? She was your mother. Be thankful that dad found your fellow villagers. They took care of the funeral. Otherwise, they would have buried your mother like a homeless person. Blood rushed to William's head, and he took a step towards Emma, fists clenched. Just a little more and he might not have been able to control himself. But then the door opened, and a man stepped out from the yard. Seeing him, William was stunned. It was Cameron, his former deputy. He used to be gray and unremarkable, but now he looked different. Dressed in an expensive suit, with a neat haircut, and a costly ring on his finger. Emma, do you need help? He asked the woman. She turned and hurried over to him, embracing him. No, my dear, he's leaving, she said. So, you've taken my place. William smirked. No, now, I'm just in my rightful place. Cameron replied coldly. William, you should leave. Yes, indeed, I have nothing more to do here. William replied, trying to appear as indifferent as possible. Emma, you'll regret what you've done. You'll see. The boomerang effect will kick in. Are you threatening me? Emma raised an eyebrow, pressing herself against Cameron. Keep in mind, I can actually call the police. Don't bother, I'm leaving. Be happy, William said with a wry smile and walked away. He heard the gate click shut, and the voices faded as he walked and walked. There were no thoughts in his head, just emptiness. No, everything had burned out a long time ago when he found out about the divorce. But William had never imagined just how deceitful his ex-wife could be. Now he had seen it and was horrified. Was it because of her that he had ruined his life? William wandered the city aimlessly for a long time, lost in thought. Suddenly, he felt a slight nausea. He remembered that he hadn't eaten anything all day. He counted his money. It wasn't much. Then William remembered the watch in his pocket. He could pawn them. William took them out, and suddenly his hand trembled as if from a burn. Emma had given him those watches. He looked for a trash can. There was a small cafe on the corner. He walked towards it and threw the watches away without regret. The smells coming from the cafe were enticing. William decided to go in. He could afford a bun with tea at least. He opened the door and bumped into a slender, gray-haired man. William, he exclaimed. Ethan, William asked hesitantly. That's right, me. I recognized you, even though it's been so many years since you left our village. What a coincidence. Ethan was the math teacher from his old school. He used to come to Belgium for educational forums as one of the experienced educators. And now, as he was rushing to the train station, he never expected to meet his former student, although he was very glad to see him. You wanted a snack? Ethan asked simply after the customary greetings. Come on, 
I'll have another coffee. William bought the cheapest bun and some tea. While he ate, Ethan drank his coffee, glancing alternately at William and out the window. They both remained silent. So, tell me, the old teacher finally spoke up. There's not much to tell. William shrugged. I don't want to talk about it, Ethan. Understood. The teacher tactfully replied. If you want to add to your answer later, I'll listen. I won't ask any more questions for now, although I understand that you've been treated unfairly. I judged that from what they did to your mother after her death. She lay in the morgue for two weeks until the villagers collected enough money, organized a car, and it took more time to get here. You did that, William's voice trembled. Not just me, the whole village helped. The chairman of the village council is a good man, young but understanding. He went out of his way to help. Don't worry, now your parents are together in heaven. But William, life goes on. I see pain and resentment in your eyes, so make sure you don't make mistakes. Forgive those who wronged you. Time will take care of them. William looked at his teacher in surprise. How did Ethan guess what he was afraid to admit to himself? Indeed, in his soul, a growing sense of indignation had begun, and if initially, upon leaving Emma, he just wanted to forget her. Later on, it was as if someone had whispered to him, seek revenge, make her answer. Have you ever thought about going back home, to the village? The teacher's question brought him back to reality. What would I do there? William shrugged. I'll give it a try here. Well, it's up to you. Ethan nodded in response. If you decide to return, no one will drive you away. But there's one catch. Your parents' house burned down two years ago struck by lightning in the spring. And where should I go then? William sighed. At least here, I have a place to spend the night. But it's easier back home. Ethan shook his head. Think about it. They've known you there since childhood. That's exactly it. They know me, William sighed. In my whole history too. Don't rush to hold grudges against people. Sometimes they're wiser than they seem. Ethan advised. They talked a little more and bid each other farewell warmly. Ethan hurried to catch his train, while William headed to that basement, which had suddenly become his home. There, Laura was already waiting for him. She saw him and almost rushed to greet him, looking at him with a guilty expression. She explained that the management had come today and demanded that she hire a new person for the janitor position. Well, I agree, Laura. I'll work for you, William said. Oh, William, it's too late. Aunt Laura sighed. They've already hired someone else. You see, you didn't leave any documents for me, like your ID or permission. I see. William chuckled. So, even to become a janitor, you need connections. What connections? Laura waved her hand. It's just that the management is always looking for ways to save money. They found some foreign worker. They can pay him less. And one more thing. William, I mentioned you, but as soon as the boss heard that you recently got out of prison, he immediately refused. I'm sorry. Oh well. Why are you apologizing? William tried to smile. I never actually told you whether I agreed to work for you or not. It's okay. I'll find something else. Can I pick up my backpack, at least? It's already in my office, Laura replied. After spending some time with Laura, William left. He didn't know where he was going or why. After prison, after everything that had happened to him, there was a sense of emptiness. He couldn't even understand how his legs had brought him to the office where he used to work. William sat down on a nearby bench and watched as people entered and exited the office. The hustle and bustle, the conversations. Did William want to see any of his former subordinates or colleagues? No, because over these five years, everyone had revealed their true colors. Not a single person had remembered him. That meant he wasn't needed. William saw a car pull up to the office. Jeremy, Emma, and Cameron got out of it, chatting cheerfully as they headed inside. The turmoil in William's soul was indescribable. He wanted to rush towards them, knock them down, trample them. But then he remembered Ethan's words. Forgive them. Time will be their judge. William sat back down on the bench and began to contemplate. What had he really wanted? It was expected from his father-in-law that business was the priority. As for Emma, Perhaps William had simply loved her too much and hadn't noticed her true nature. And Cameron, he was of no concern. Who knew what would happen to him in the future? William reluctantly stood up and walked away from the office. He continued walking through the city, realizing that he was a stranger here, unwanted by anyone. 
But Ethan had been right all along he needed to return home, to his hometown, to the village. At the train station, William's spirits sank when he heard the price of a ticket to a station. And what if I? He timidly asked the young cashier. This is a long-distance train. There are no general compartments, only coupe seats. The girl replied with a hint of disdain. Are you going to buy it or not? Not right now, mumbled William, picked up his passport, and under the judgmental gazes of other passengers waiting in line, he walked away from the station. The ticket cost almost a hundred dollars, and he didn't have that much. What was he going to do? He felt like he might cry out of despair. William sat down on a bench near the station and scolded himself. Why hadn't he asked about the ticket price when talking to Ethan? Maybe the old man would have lent him the money. He was making a big deal out of it. He would have returned it later. But Laura, why hadn't he asked her for a loan? After all, he would have paid her back, although it wasn't certain that Laura would have agreed. They worn that clothes. With his head down, William thought and found no solution. He was hungry, thirsty, and the tempting smell of something fried and delicious wafted nearby. William sighed, heading towards the hot dog stand when suddenly he collided with a man who was loudly talking on the phone as he walked. Justin, where are you? The man yelled into the phone. I've got a shipment to unload. You need to get out here. Have you gone crazy? Get here now. What am I supposed to do? William immediately realized that this was his chance. Excuse me. He caught up with the man as he disconnected the call and brusquely walked towards one of the market pavilions. I overheard you need a laborer. I can do it. You. The man evaluated William with a smirk and shrugged. Did you just get out of prison or something? Yes. William confessed. But I don't want to go back there. I need to earn money for a ticket to my hometown. How much do you need? The man asked. A hundred dollars. Well, I won't give you that much. There's only fifty bucks worth of work, tops. But okay, let's go. We'll figure something out. My name is Steven, by the way. Yours. William. All right, William. I need you to unload fruits and vegetables. I have a little store nearby. You'll finish in a couple of hours. Is that okay with you? Sounds good. William nodded. A small market pavilion stood not far from the train station. Stephen had been cursing all the way there, and from his words, William understood that it had been a tough day for the merchant. The car had broken down, the saleswoman had fallen all, and now the loader hadn't shown up for work, yet the merchandise was waiting by the door. In theory, one might have felt sympathy, but William was genuinely delighted. He had a chance to earn some money. Who knows, maybe more odd jobs would come his way, and he could save up for that ticket. William completed the task quickly and Stephen just silently observed his work. When William had neatly placed the last crate, Stephen suddenly handed him a hundred dollars. But we agreed on a different amount. William stammered, confused. Consider it charitable assistance. Stephen chuckled. I know what it's like to be left without support after leaving prison. I've been there, although it was a long time ago. Kind people helped me back then, so I guess I'm paying it forward. Take it, don't hesitate, and make sure not to squander it. I don't drink, William replied. Yeah, I figured as much. I can see you're not a drinker. You're just going through a rough patch, kid. But don't lose hope. Things will get better. William thanked him. They shook hands and bid each other farewell. A few hours later, William was already sitting in a train, gazing out the window and thinking, I'll be home soon. True, nobody was waiting for him there either but the thought of going back to his hometown gave him strength. William couldn't help but smile. It seemed that he and Ethan would cross paths soon. The teacher would arrive home in the evening, while William would get there in the morning. But before that, he had nearly two days of travel ahead of him. Time on the train passed quickly. William spent most of it sleeping or just lying down, facing the wall. Only as it began to dawn did the conductor tap him on the shoulder. Your station is in 15 minutes she said. What? Already? William jumped up, narrowly avoiding hitting his head on the upper bunk. Don't rush, you'll make it. The young woman smiled and continued down the aisle. And there, William stood on the platform at a small station. His heart felt heavy. He remembered how many years ago he had left the station for the big city, embarking on a new life that he had believed would surely be happy. And now, he had returned with nothing but the stigma of a former convict. 
scheduled buses wouldn't be running for a couple of hours. William decided not to wait and began walking to his hometown on foot. It was only about 10 kilometers away. He walked along the deserted road, noticing every detail. The old meat processing plant at the entrance to the regional settlement still stood, albeit worn and dilapidated. It was probably closed by now, with only its walls remaining. Further on, they had created a new landfill, surrounded by a fence. Oh, so much garbage. Why wasn't it being recycled? Why were they just piling it up? In the distance, he could see a pine forest. William even stopped, realizing that something was wrong with the forest. It was disappearing. Many trees stood dry and lifeless. William sighed heavily, recalling his boyhood days when he used to run here with other kids. William continued walking down the road, reminiscing about the past. He quickened his pace, but when he reached the village itself, he suddenly stopped. Where was he rushing to and after all? Ethan had told him that his parents' house had burned down. Where could he possibly go? Nevertheless, I'll go home. He decided and took a step down the street. The villagers had already let their livestock out to graze in the fields, and everyone was busy in their yards and gardens. No one paid much attention to the tall man walking along the road, glancing around with curiosity. William walked and marveled. His hometown was still alive. In the center of the village, they had built a new store, and they had replaced the roof on the school. Of course, there were some abandoned estates, but not too many. William stopped next to a rusty gate overgrown with grass, took a deep sigh, and pushed the creaky, rusty gate. The gate survived, but the parental home did not. He walked around the yard and sat down next to the charred wall, lost in thought. He was finally home, but here, he wasn't expected either. Who's rummaging around there? He heard a creaky, elderly voice say, What do you want? Looking for firewood or something? Don't touch it. It's not yours. Move along. Can't you see the house burned down? William, surprised, turned to the voice and saw a frail, gray-haired old man in the neighboring yard. He squinted his eyes trying to remember. Noel, is that you? He eventually spoke, recognizing his neighbor. That's right, I'm Noel. The bewildered old man nodded. And who are you? I don't recognize you. Oh, wait, William, is it you? Oh my, you've grown to look just like your late father. Noel hopped over the rickety fence, and the two of them were sitting together by the burnt-down house, catching up. Noel told him how he was the first to see the lightning strike the family home, and how he had called the firefighters. They arrived quickly, but the house was old, and it had mostly burned down, leaving only the walls. Are you here to visit your parents' graves, or something else? The old man inquired. I'm not sure. William replied curtly. Oh boy, you must be exhausted from the journey, the old man surmised. Come with me, Isadora will be thrilled to see you. Are you sure? William smirked. Noel, you probably know where I've been. I do, and so what? That's not my concern. We only know you from the good side. Let's go. She's prepared some food. Thank you, but I wanted to visit the graves first. And that's the right thing to do. The old man nodded. Come on, I'll accompany you. Although William wanted to take a solitary walk, he realized that he couldn't shake off his persistent neighbor. So, they walked together to the cemetery, which was very close by. Along the way, Grandpa Noel shared how the entire village had bid farewell to William's mother on her final journey. They walked along the street, and Grandpa kept on talking and talking, while William listened in silence. On their way, they met a few fellow villagers. Some recognized William, greeted him, nodded, and he reciprocated. But behind his back, he felt that people were whispering and maybe even pointing fingers. However, William tried not to pay attention to it and didn't take offense. The cemetery was quiet. Noel, I want to sit by the graves alone. William said softly. Please don't be offended. I understand. Noel nodded in response. Your mother and father are together. Do you remember where your father's grave is? Of course, William replied just as quietly and walked deeper into the cemetery. There it was, the familiar little fence, the old paint peeling off. William froze. He remembered clearly how he used to walk with his father through the woods, and their path always led by this very place. He was around eight years old, and always felt uneasy when he saw the crosses and graves beyond the fence. His father, noticing his unease, would pat him on the shoulder and say, Son, there's no need to fear the dead. 
It's the living that can bring trouble. Back then, William had just looked at his father in astonishment. Why would he be afraid of the living? There were so many scary stories about the dead. Now, with the passage of time, William understood how right his father had been. He also remembered how his mother loved looking at the sky, trying to find animal shapes and birds in the clouds. One day, she saw a house in the clouds, or rather, a whole palace. I'd love to live in a place like that, his mother had said with a smile. William was around 10 years old then. He had made a solemn promise to one day build a palace just like that for his mother. He had indeed started designing architectural plans for buildings, but for his mother, well, he hadn't had the chance. She passed away before he could fulfill that promise, and now, she was up there, in her own castle, looking down on him. William sighed, looked around, and couldn't help but feel how sad it all was. It was incredibly challenging to comprehend that he was now alone in this world. William looked around. He decided that he would paint the fence later, or even better, replace the markers for his parents, but that would have to wait until he could afford it. For now, he needed to clear the weeds from the graves. There was quite a bit of overgrowth. William tidied up, sat quietly for a while, bowing his head. Then he stood up, whispering softly, rest in peace, my dear parents, I'll always be with you. After the cemetery, Noel led William to his house. While he had claimed earlier that his wife was thrilled to have guests, that wasn't entirely true. Isadora was just finishing up cooking in the kitchen when they entered the house. She pulled her husband aside, leaving William in the kitchen. He sat on the edge of a stool and patiently awaited the outcome. Why did you bring that criminal into our home? William overheard Isadora's loud whisper from the hallway. Have you completely lost your mind? He's going to rob us or worse. Are you insane? Noel whispered back just as fiercely. William is a decent man. He made mistakes, but he's paid for them. You feed him. He's tired from the journey. He needs some rest. You are going to tell me we should put him to sleep too? Isadora continued grumbling. William, realizing he could potentially cause a scandal, stood up decisively. I apologize, dear neighbors. I'll be on my way, he said, peering into the hallway. Where are you going? Noel pretended to be surprised. We're about to have some tea. No, thank you. I don't want any, William declined politely. Under Isadora's disapproving gaze, William exited the house. At the yard's entrance, he spotted Ethan. Ah, uh, there you are, the old teacher exclaimed with joy. I heard you came and went to the cemetery, but I didn't find you there. So, did you decide to come back after all? Yeah, something like that, William replied with a hint of sadness. I hopped on the next train and followed you guys, but maybe it was a mistake. It seems I'm not entirely welcome here either. Don't take offense at the people here. They're used to thinking in stereotypes. Spent time in prison. Must be a criminal. It'll pass. Let's go to my place. Ethan reassured him. I'm afraid your wife won't be too pleased with me either. William shook his head. My Joan already knows you are here and she's preparing dinner for you. Let's go, freshen up, take a rest, and tomorrow we'll visit the head of the village council. He's returning from his business trip, and I've already spoken to him about you. Ethan took William by the sleeve and led him along. There was no choice. William complied. Joan was a quiet and calm woman who had worked at the local library her entire life. She received William quite hospitably. First and foremost, she sent him to the shower and handed him a clean set of clothes. These belong to our son, she said hesitantly. I think they should fit you. You're right. Your son must have been quite the sturdy lad. William smiled as he thought of Christian, their own son who was just a year older. He was indeed a tall, strong boy, not taking after either his mother or his father, as the villagers often teased, wondering aloud if he was adopted. But Ethan and Joan would just smile, proud of their son. To Joan, he was like her own flesh and blood, despite being Ethan's grandson. Christian took after her side of the family. He was a good boy, now serving in the military. Soon after, having freshened up and changed into clean clothes, William found himself at the dinner table with his hosts. The spread was impressive. Joan had prepared baked potatoes, soup, and even lasagna. However, William only ate a little before starting to doze off. He was exhausted from the journey, there was no denying it. 
Ethan guided him to the room that used to belong to their son, and there, on clean sheets, William fell into a deep and restful sleep, dreaming of his childhood. In his dream, he was with his father by the river, fishing. The fishing rod was delicate and fragile, and suddenly, there was a sharp tug on the line. William tried to reel it in, but he couldn't. That's when his father, setting aside his own fishing gear, came to help him, and together they pulled out an enormous carp. Dad, look at this fish. William marveled. What should we do with it? How about we release it? His father suddenly suggested. How? It's so huge. Can we do that? We can. Let it live. His father said gently as he carefully removed the fish from the hook and released it back into the water. William gazed at the clear reflection in the water, watching the fish swim away gracefully. He felt a pang of disappointment. He had caught such a massive fish, and his father had let it go. Son, don't be upset with me, his father said. We'll catch plenty of other fish, but this one, this one should live. Why? Because this fish is the ruler of these waters. How can we leave the river without its master? Everything would perish then. William stared at his father, thinking he was joking, but his father was dead serious. Just then, his mother ran to the river, embracing his father, and he lifted her in his arms. Suddenly, there was a bright light, and both his mother and father disappeared, leaving only a blinding radiance. William struggled to open his eyes. The sun was shining directly in his face. He couldn't immediately tell what time it was until he glanced at the clock and let out a whistle. Morning. It meant he had slept through the entire previous day and night. Clearly, fatigue had caught up with him. Shortly after, Ethan entered the room and invited him to breakfast. Don't forget we're going to see the chairman. The old teacher reminded him. I remember. William nodded. But I don't know how he can help me. Maybe he'll give me some abandoned house. What kind of job is there anyway? There is one position. Ethan smiled. But he'll tell you about it himself. But how can they implore someone with a criminal record? William raised an eyebrow. Why are you wearing that cross on yourself? The teacher frowned. You've paid your dues. It's time to start a new life. William just sighed. Words were one thing. Reality was quite another. However, he resolved to talk to the chairman. As they approached the brick building with the village council flag, William slowed his pace. Ethan touched his arm. What's the matter? Ethan asked. I've been turned away so many times in these past days that I'm not sure if I should even go there. William confessed. In any case, you should. You're a new person here, and the chairman needs to know about everyone. Ethan insisted sternly. William was reminded of how Ethan used to furrow his brows back in school whenever someone disrupted the class. The memory made him smile, and he confidently stepped into the village council building. In a spacious office behind a large desk sat the chairman, a man about his own age. William greeted him and introduced himself. At first, it seemed like the chairman didn't recognize him, but then he broke into a bright smile. William, did you really forget me? He exclaimed. And in that voice, William remembered, it was Michael. The very same Michael with whom they used to roam the streets before they even started school, sometimes pilfering apples from the locals. What on earth did they need him for? He wasn't needed at all, but the adrenaline rush was something else especially when they had to escape from the collective farm guard. Afterward, Michael moved away with his parents, only visiting his grandmother during school holidays. After school, they lost touch. Former friends embraced, chatted, and fondly reminisced about past misadventures. Ethan, seeing that everything was fine, bid his farewell and left, figuring they could handle things on their own. So, have you decided to come back home? Michael asked. I also decided to live here. I studied public administration at the institute, returned to the regional center, and they offered me the position here. The people elected me, and now I'm almost the mayor. Michael smiled and looked at William inquisitively. But how did things go so wrong for you? My friend, you had everything going for you business, family. I was a fool, William frowned. Well, if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. Michael conceded. Let's discuss business instead. I understand you need housing and a job. I can offer you a choice of two abandoned but perfectly livable houses. But there's another option. It comes with work and a house. What do you mean? William asked, puzzled. We need a gamekeeper. 
Michael admitted and went on to share a sorrowful story. They had an old man serving as the gamekeeper for many years. Scott lived and he had a sturdy little house there. He took good care of the forest and the wildlife, but then poachers started appearing in the woods. You see, in recent years, the population of deer had increased. Elks came, wild boars too. These poachers roamed the forests in search of easy prey. Scott had sternly warned them, prevented their illegal activities, and even managed to catch a few of them. But then they found the old man dead by the river. The police investigated, but the case was eventually closed due to a lack of evidence. Though everyone suspected the poachers had something to do with Scott's death, there were no leads. And now, for almost a year, our forests have been without protection. Michael sighed bitterly. Regional gamekeepers occasionally visit, but it's not the same. A true steward is needed in the woods. So, will you go? The salary is quite decent. Me. William was taken aback. Am I allowed to? Yes. Michael nodded. I've already inquired. Are you interested? William looked thoughtful, and then a dream from today came back to him. His father had spoken about there needing to be a guardian in the river, and now Michael was talking about being the steward of the forest. It felt like deja vu, or maybe the dream was a sign. Was this how his father blessed him for his new job? I'm interested. William nodded. That's good to hear. Let's go take a look at the house. You can choose which one you like. Michael, William suddenly stopped him. You mentioned the previous gamekeeper had a house. Is it still intact? It's intact. Michael raised an eyebrow. But it's in the forest, about five kilometers from the village. Do you really want to live there? To be honest, yes. It's hard for me to be around people. I feel like everyone is watching and judging me. Well, you should stop thinking like that, Michael advised. You can't afford to be nervous around everyone. Besides, maybe it's better this way for now. You'll live alone with nature. Clear your thoughts. And who knows, maybe I'll come visit you one day when I need a break from my wife and daughter. I brought her here when the people elected me. At first, she was upset, but now she seems to have adjusted. Getting tired of each other? William asked. No, not at all, Michael chuckled. Sometimes, you just need a breather. And with that, the friends reached an agreement. Michael took William to the regional authorities, vouched for him, and soon enough, William took on his new role. He was now the gamekeeper. A new chapter began in William's life. The past seemed like a story that was no longer about him. He thought less and less about Emma's betrayal. In fact, he realized he didn't need anyone. He became like a lone wolf, feeling free and light only in the woods. The old gamekeeper's house turned out to be in quite a decent condition. William fixed it up, and Michael and Ethan helped him initially with money and supplies. William settled into this forest cabin. He rarely interacted with people. Mostly, he went to the district center to buy groceries and for work-related matters. On rare occasions, he would visit the village shop or the local council. The forest became his sanctuary, his remedy. William loved listening to the birds singing in the mornings, and he would often smile as he watched the deer come very close to his dwelling, unaware of his presence. One day, William was awakened by a noise. He jumped up, wondering what was happening outside. It felt like someone was persistently trying to break down the wall of his forest cabin. William looked out and was stunned. There was an elk by the wall, rubbing its side against it as if scratching an itch. Then, the beast and the man locked eyes. Oh, how that elk bolted into the forest, like a freight train, knocking down everything in its path. William spent the rest of the day repairing the fence. In William's territory, it was quiet, and for several months, he hadn't noticed any poachers. But one day, they finally arrived. It was a chilly autumn day. In the morning, the sun had attempted to warm the cold ground and forest, but by noon, it had given up and disappeared behind gray clouds. A drizzle mixed with snow began to fall. William wasn't in a hurry to go outside, but he had to. He had noticed several raccoon-like dogs in the area during the week, and they were causing quite a bit of trouble. He needed to determine how many of them were roaming around. They were a very destructive animal, and if their population grew unchecked, they would decimate all the rabbits and foxes in the area. And when winter came, they'd fall into hibernation leaving nothing for the predators. 
He needed to conduct a count, and then the authorities could decide how many of these wild dogs could be given to hunters. William walked outside, wrapped tightly in his coat, and contemplated how everything in nature had changed. In the past, in their forest, besides hares and deer, there was hardly anyone else. Or was it just his perception because he hadn't fully immersed himself in the natural world before? Thankfully, there were no bears around, and thankfully, the wolves stayed clear of their region. Something flickered in the bushes. William only caught sight of a fluffy black tail. Right, it was one of those raccoon-like dogs. He stopped, and suddenly, he heard a commotion nearby, followed by another. Who could it be? No hunters were scheduled for today, and this part of the forest was off-limits. It was a wildlife sanctuary. William cautiously moved toward the noise and soon encountered a horrifying scene. Three men were butchering a huge, magnificent moose. Halt! William shouted. Buddy, figure it out. One of them cursed. The huge men raised their guns and pointed them at William. Just as William managed to dodge, a shot rang out. Realizing that he couldn't handle three of them, he stepped back and called the police. Meanwhile, the poacher continued firing, oblivious to the consequences. He was intoxicated. William managed to circle around him, disarm him, and tie him up. Seeing their comrade subdued, the second man, armed with a knife, rushed at William. The gamekeeper skillfully avoided the attack and managed to restrain the criminal. The third one, cowardly, fled into the bushes. He was later found by the police officers, wandering through the forest, somewhat lost. This incident earned William a reputation in the area. Everyone talked about how William had neutralized three criminals. In this situation, the only regret was for the moose. It couldn't be brought back. The locals in the village began to treat their gamekeeper with more respect. There were no more whispers behind his back, and nobody remembered William's past. Unmarried young women would gaze meaningfully at the gamekeeper when he appeared in the village, but William paid no attention. He didn't need anyone, neither love nor friendship. He was a loner, although soon, he did find a true friend. On that November evening, William was returning from the district center. After a meeting with fellow gamekeepers, the road had frozen, and his car was confidently gliding along the bumpy track. Up ahead was a dark foreign car. Suddenly, something flew out of the window of that car, and it sped up. William saw it and cursed. Clearly, they threw out some trash. What kind of people are they? As he passed a small ravine where the object had flown, he cast a disgusted glance and immediately slammed on the brakes. In the ravine, near the withered grass and bushes, he saw a black bag in which someone was moving. He got out of the car and descended. In the thick bag, tightly sealed with tape, someone was still struggling. There was a mix of crying and whimpering. William took out his knife and cut open the bag. From the opening, a tiny puppy's face peered out. It couldn't have been more than two or three weeks old. Those bastards, William muttered and gently picked up the poor little thing. The puppy immediately grabbed his finger and started gnawing on it. Hungry, William cautiously petted the little one, tucked it under his jacket, and got back into the car. He placed the animal in a small box that happened to be in the car's interior, put it on the passenger seat, and drove back home. These scoundrels, William cursed as he drove, they should be sealed in a bag and thrown out in the cold. But don't worry, Charlie, don't worry, we'll be home soon, and I'll feed you and put you to sleep. You'll live with me now. Michael had been suggesting that William get a dog for a while, but William was still contemplating it. He was deciding on the breed, age, and gender of the dog, wondering if a puppy would be the best choice. However, fate intervened. William took care of a puppy that he named Charlie, and the name stuck. Within a year, Charlie had grown into a decent-sized dog, a mix of a shepherd and a mutt. Charlie was loyal to his owner, faithfully following him along the forest trails. He was a very intelligent dog and served as William's right-hand companion. They both lived in the forest cabin, Two years had passed since William returned to his hometown. He remained a solitary figure, uninterested in women. His domain was the forest, wide open spaces, and that was his entire life. However, the local girls were infatuated with him. How could such a handsome man be single? Nobody remembered William's past anymore. He had earned trust and respect among the locals through his actions. But can a man truly be alone? During the summer, 
young women would often roam around near the gamekeeper's cabin, hoping for his attention. William would occasionally pass by, nodding in greeting, and then continue on his way, while Charlie would bark at the more daring admirers. One of the local girls, Ruby, was particularly bold. Everyone in the area knew her, especially the male population. She was undeniably beautiful, with almond-shaped eyes, black hair, delicate porcelain-like skin, and an attractive figure. Her mother, Amanda, scolded her countless times upon discovering yet another romance of her daughter's. But Ruby didn't care. She would lay low for a month or two, and then head to the district center again in search of love. She had already exhausted the supply of eligible bachelors in the village. Despite all this, she wasn't foolish. She even graduated from some technical school, but as soon as she returned home from the city, she resumed being a burden on her mother. And then, William caught her eye. Unlike others, she didn't beat around the bush. She went straight to his house. It was a warm May evening. William decided to turn in early, when he suddenly heard Charlie barking in the yard. Charlie had broken free from his chain. William had already disciplined all the poachers, and none of them dared to trespass in his forests anymore. So, what was it? A wild animal, perhaps. He cautiously opened the door and found Ruby standing on the porch, her eyes made up, hair let loose, dressed in a thin sundress. Hello, she smiled. Can I come in? Why's that? William smirked. It seems like nightfall is already upon us. That's exactly why, she winked. It's boring to drink tea alone. Not at all. You should go back. The mosquitoes will devour you. You've dolled up quite a bit. William, I've come for you. I've liked you for a long time, but you've always kept your distance. So, I decided to take matters into my own hands. Let me in. You're lonely. I understand that. William didn't say a word, but simply stepped onto the porch, took her hand, and led her back towards the village. Ruby, on the other hand, protested vigorously during the walk, expressing her disbelief at being turned away. William brought her to a clearing and pointed towards the village, which was clearly visible not far away. Go, and don't think of coming to me again, he grumbled. Otherwise, I'll let the dog loose. With that, he turned and walked into the woods. You fool, Ruby shouted after him. You'll regret this. If only there was something to regret. William called back with a smirk before disappearing into the forest. Ruby made her way back home. On her way, she encountered a local gossip girl near the first vegetable garden. She immediately spread the word that William had rejected Ruby. Other contenders for William's heart were quick to join in, taking offense at Ruby's actions. She didn't bother to explain anything to them. She even enjoyed the rumor. After all, who knows, maybe William would come around now. In light of these events, she visited the gamekeeper a couple more times in the evenings. However, who knew about the last visit? Ruby strutted around the village, smiling mysteriously, and everyone believed her. But nobody explicitly asked William why he got involved with this girl. Even Michael and Ethan remained tactfully silent during their encounters. It wasn't their business. A man lived alone in the woods, and he clearly longed for some feminine company. Then, suddenly, Ruby started to round out a bit as August approached. The first change in her appearance was noticed by her mother. Oh, Ruby, did you finally get yourself into trouble? Amanda exclaimed, is the gamekeeper the father? Ruby didn't respond to her mother and just smiled mysteriously, examining her reflection in the mirror. Ruby, I'm asking you, her mother demanded, reaching for a towel, ready to give her misbehaving daughter a slap. However, she immediately thought better of it. It wasn't the right thing to do. Ruby was pregnant, after all. Mama, Ruby finally replied, what's got you so nervous? You know everything. The entire village was well aware of it. And does William know? Amanda asked. He's just starting to suspect. Ruby mumbled. I'll tell him today. Oh, Ruby, did you actually find a decent man? Amanda sighed. Well, may God bless you. Later that day, Amanda went to the store and whispered the secret of her daughter's pregnancy to the shopkeeper, Anna. Within an hour, the entire village knew that the gamekeeper would soon become a father. However, William himself was completely oblivious to this news. He continued to live in the forest with his faithful dog, Charlie. Ruby occasionally visited him, and while he found her persistence surprising, 
He never considered starting a relationship with her during all that time. When he saw Ruby again, he would sigh, take her by the hand, and lead her back to the village, explaining that there could be nothing between them because she wasn't to his taste. Ruby would pout and retort, asking what he found appealing, the forest animals or the old women. William would just laugh. He no longer held a grudge against the somewhat naive girl. He was simply waiting for her to tie her of visiting him. And then, all of a sudden, Ruby found herself pregnant, considering that she hadn't been involved with anyone closely. Just running around in the woods, it was quite a surprise. On that day, William was sitting on the porch of his cabin when he heard a car pull up in a nearby clearing. Charlie perked up his ears. Quiet, boy, William said to his dog, straining his eyes to see into the distance. Who could be coming here? At that moment, William noticed Michael approaching him. William was surprised because the chairman didn't visit him in the woods often, so something important must have come up. Indeed, the young chairman had urgent business to discuss. He had heard the rumors about Ruby's pregnancy, and he could no longer remain silent. William, you're a grown man. Couldn't you find a serious girlfriend? Michael began. I don't understand. William stared at him. What girlfriend? Why did you get involved with Ruby? Michael asked. I wouldn't normally interfere in your affairs. I understand that nature takes its course, but a child changes everything. Now you'll have to marry her. Marry who? William was bewildered. Ruby, Michael clarified. Why? William questioned. Because she's pregnant with your child. Michael exclaimed. The whole village is buzzing about this news. Ruby, pregnant with my child. William blinked in disbelief and struggled to find the words. But that's impossible. William, you can tell me the truth. Michael urged. I am telling the truth. William replied. There has never been anything between us. She came to me, that's true. She looked into my eyes and made advances, but I always sent her away, whatever you want, I swear. You're not lying, Michael asked. No, I'm not, William affirmed. Women, Michael grumbled. They've stirred up quite a commotion and I got caught in the middle of it. Ruby is telling everyone that you're the father of her child. Can you believe it? She's just naive, William chuckled. She blurted out the first thing that came to her mind and ended up believing it herself. I need to talk to her. Is she in the village now? I think so, Michael replied. Soon, the villagers saw William arriving at Amanda's house and stepping out of his car. He walked slowly into the yard. Ruby was in the middle of hanging laundry and humming a tune. Hello, Ruby, William called out to her. Hearing his voice, Ruby paled and almost dropped the wash basin. Hello, she mumbled. Why aren't you saying anything to me? He approached her, looking into her eyes intensely. I heard that I'm supposed to become a father soon. I just can't understand how. How? How? And Ruby mumbled, avoiding eye contact. And you don't know. No, I don't, William said. I've only held your hand. And suddenly you're expecting. Aren't you ashamed or embarrassed? I'm not ashamed, Ruby whispered. She raised her head and defiantly met William's gaze. I've told everyone that we were together. You can't prove anything, and you can interpret it however you want, but everyone around here now knows that I'm pregnant by you. If you try to deny it, everyone will be on my side. Ruby, come to your senses. This is not how relationships start. William shook his head and walked away from the yard. What people in the village said about the gamekeeper afterward was truly something, especially Amanda, who had considered him a prospective son-in-law. Ruby strutted around the village with a proud look, pursing her lips when someone asked about the child's father. However, not everyone believed this version of events. Ethan, his wife, and a few other serious folks in the village believed that William had been falsely accused. As for William, he preferred to remain silent in the face of all the inquiries and accusations. Why bother defending himself against something that never happened? Once, when everyone was particularly pestering him, he ran into Ruby and threatened to report her to the police for spreading false accusations. Ruby seemed to back down at that moment, but soon things returned to the way they were, and William waved it off. People would talk, and eventually, they'd move on. The people truly stopped talking when Ruby gave birth. They were simply stunned by what had occurred. The midwife was the first to experience shock when she delivered the baby. When she laid eyes on the child, 
She nearly sat down right there in the delivery room. Ruby have given birth to a child with dark skin. A little one with a chocolate-like complexion, curly hair, and plump lips. Such children had never before appeared in the provincial maternity ward. Upon seeing her baby, Ruby burst into tears. Later, in her hospital room, she confessed to the other new mothers that she had a brief affair with a black guy when she visited her friend in the city for a week. She did spend another night with a white guy afterward. Ruby had actually thought she was pregnant by the white guy, so she calmly placed all the blame on the gamekeeper. Why not? He walked around in silence. Almost everyone believed he was the father, and then a little dark-skinned baby arrived. The nurses reassured the hapless mother that the baby wouldn't be entirely black. After all, he was a mixed-race child, and mixed-race children were always beautiful. However, this didn't make things easier for Ruby. She couldn't even bear to look at her child. She didn't want to take him home from the maternity ward. Amanda, upon learning of this fiasco, was also in shock. She had already inquired about genetic testing, asked knowledgeable people about the gamekeeper's salary, and wondered how much child support she could extract from him. She was interested in how to secure her financial future. And then there was this dark-skinned child, and it was clear that William had nothing to do with it. Oh, what a shame. Amanda lamented. People will laugh at us now. And she didn't want to take her grandson from the maternity ward either. They probably would have left the baby there without a second thought. But then Ruby remembered about the maternal capital. And what did it matter? Whose child it was didn't really matter now. She would get the money anyway. In short, they discharged Ruby along with the baby. Amanda picked them up from the maternity ward without even looking at her grandson once. It was the beginning of December. Three weeks had passed. People were in full swing preparing for Christmas. It seemed like everyone had forgotten about the Ruby baby story. And what did they care? Now it was her responsibility to raise the child. William finally breathed a sigh of relief and only occasionally smiled at the memory of how Ruby had wanted to make him the father against his will. And then, December 25th arrived. That year, such a bitter cold descended upon them. People hid in their homes, dogs burrowed into their kennels, and birds froze in midair. On that evening, William decided to check the deer feeders. In such cold, the animals needed food even more, and Christmas. He hadn't celebrated it in so many years. This year was no exception, although both Michael and Ethan had invited him over. William decided to wait for Christmas, have a meal with his dog, who had moved into his house in this freezing weather, enjoy a piece of meat, and then go to sleep. But for now, he needed to check the feeders. William put on his hunting skis, loaded his backpack with salt, and headed to the feeders. Charlie ran alongside him as usual. The sun was already setting in a crimson glow, and the cold seemed even sharper. William rubbed his gloves and his cheeks. Jer, can't linger, or I might freeze, he said to himself. He increased his pace. Soon, he was at the feeding spot. He added some salt, straightened the twigs, made sure there was plenty of grain, and started heading back. Charlie, letting out a joyful bark, turned as well. You are cold, Pothing. Don't worry, we'll warm up soon. William told him with a smile. Charlie took the lead, running along the well-trodden ski path. Suddenly, not far from home, a few hundred meters away, Charlie stopped by a thick furred spruce tree and bristled, letting out a low growl. Who do you smell there? William wondered. A hare, perhaps. Although, the dog's reaction seemed more like how he'd respond to a wolf. William raised his rifle. He'd meet a gray one like he should. But then Charlie froze, and suddenly he whimpered and crawled toward a branch that covered the trunk of the tree. What have you sensed there? William was concerned. A rabbit, maybe, but in such cold. However, the dog's reaction was more akin to what he'd do when encountering a wolf. William raised his rifle, ready to face a gray one as was usual in these pots. But Charlie froze and whimpered. He crawled towards a branch that obscured the tree trunk. William stood there in bewilderment trying to figure things out, and then he heard a sound from beneath the spruce tree. At first, he thought there was something wrong with his head, but then he gasped. It was the cry of a baby, a quiet, resigned cry. William made his way to the spruce tree, lifted its fluffy paw, and spotted a little basket, the kind people use for collecting mushrooms. But this one didn't contain mushrooms. 
Instead, there was an old, thick blanket rolled up into a bundle, and from this bundle came a faint, plaintive cry. William reached out to unroll the blanket, trembling, and verify that his ears weren't deceiving him. But then he hesitated because it was so cold outside. If it was truly a child, they would freeze for sure. William grabbed the basket and dashed back to his house, with Charlie at his side. The dog didn't bark or whine anymore, just kept running beside him, seemingly understanding the urgency of the situation. William, clutching the basket to his chest, remembered the day he had found Charlie, abandoned and unwanted, wrapped up in a bag and left in a ditch. He wanted desperately to believe that inside this basket was a puppy, not a baby. After all, a person couldn't treat their own child like this, right? Once home, William quickly removed his jacket, placed the basket near the stove, and, with trembling hands, began to unroll the blanket. And then he saw what was inside, and he was stunned. It was indeed a baby, a dark-skinned baby. Ruby threw you away, William whispered in disbelief. The baby, still wrapped in a blanket, had stopped crying and was now just opening its mouth. It seemed the little one had exhausted its strength. How long had he been out in the cold? William shuddered at the thought of what the baby had endured. What if Charlie hadn't detected him and the baby had gone unnoticed? William quickly examined the baby. It appeared he hadn't suffered frostbite, and he seemed relatively okay, just utterly exhausted. Clearly, he wanted to eat and be held by his mother. Is this even a mother, Ruby? William muttered to himself, a wolf would fiercely protect her cub, a bird would poke out someone's eyes, and she left him to die in the cold. William awkwardly picked up the baby, cradling him gently. As the child warmed up, he began to cry again, loudly. Wow, you are quite the loud one. William chuckled softly. We'll get you some help in a moment. William called an ambulance and explained the situation. Then he called the police. The ambulance dispatch, upon learning they had to traverse a snowy road into the woods, was a bit perplexed. How can we find you? Would you consider coming to us? They asked. I'm not going. William replied firmly. The baby has been exposed to the cold enough. I didn't want to carry him through this frost any longer. You're only five kilometers away from me. The road is cleared right up to the forest. Just call me when you're close. I'll meet you by the trail. The dispatcher agreed but the police were quite surprised by William's report. Wait, didn't you call an ambulance? Well, that's good. The officer on duty responded. Let the doctors take the child. Why should we trek into the woods now? Have some decency. Let people celebrate Christmas properly, and tomorrow, the local officer will look into everything. They abandoned a child in the cold. Do you understand? William objected. He could have died. I understand everything. The officer sighed but nothing terrible happened. We'll sort it out tomorrow. Merry Christmas. He hung up before hearing William's response. Merry Christmas, William replied, listening to the dial tone. Then he looked pensively at the baby. The child had calmed down a bit, making small noises from his basket. William smiled. What a miracle he had found. He would have never believed it if someone had told him. The phone rang, interrupting William's thoughts. It was the ambulance. Distractedly, he put on his fur coat and left the house, instructing Charlie to guard the baby. The dog even gave a nod, fully comprehending the important mission his owner had entrusted him with. William reached the ambulance by the trail. The vehicle was parked at the edge of the forest, and the driver was tinkering under the hood. Beside him stood a petite female doctor in a down jacket. Oh, you made it quite far, she said, shaking her head as she approached William. We barely got here. I'm not even sure how we'll make it back. I'll manage on my way back. Don't worry, the man replied. Let's go. And who's taking care of your child? The doctor suddenly asked. With my dog, William responded. Your dog, are you out of your mind? Well, yes, William agreed. Do you suggest I carry him through this cold? I suppose so. The doctor reluctantly concurred. She grabbed her bag shouted at the driver to call her once he fixed the vehicle, and briskly followed William. Charlie, seeing the guest, initially growled but then wagged his tail. The baby was quietly whimpering in the meantime. Why is he on the floor, near the stove? The doctor exclaimed. It's the warmest spot, William explained, helping her remove her down jacket. Without the thick coat and hat, the doctor looked quite young. 
She gently lifted the baby, examined him, and concluded that, based on the preliminary inspection, the child was perfectly healthy. The cold hadn't harmed him, and he didn't have a fever. Then she swaddled him in a clean sheet that William provided. Afterward, she took out some dry formula in a bottle. We need to feed him. Do you have warm boiled water? The doctor asked sternly. William rushed to the kettle, and the water inside it was at the perfect temperature. The young woman skillfully mixed the baby formula, then took the baby in her arms and began feeding him. The baby eagerly grasped the bottle, and William's heart ached when he witnessed it. How hungry he is, William muttered, once again recalling Ruby with unkind words. Meanwhile, the paramedic, after feeding the baby, gently rocked him while softly singing a lullaby. William couldn't help but be captivated by the scene. Rebecca, lost in her thoughts, sang as if she didn't notice William's presence. The baby eventually fell asleep. We should put him somewhere while the driver fixes the car, she whispered, looking at William for agreement. Yes, of course, he replied, bustling about. Let's lay him on my couch. After gently laying the child down, William and the paramedic sat down nearby. Forgive me, but what's your name? William asked in a hushed tone. Rebecca, she replied, equally softly. Rebecca, would you like me to take you to the hospital with the driver? Why is he fussing around in the cold? They can retrieve the car tomorrow. No, he won't abandon the ambulance. Rebecca shook her head. And who would come to pick it up? We only have two vehicles. He must repair it today. After all, it's such a busy night. There will be many calls. Yes, you have quite a job. William nodded, then looked at the clock. By the way, in 10 minutes, it's Christmas. How about I open some champagne, at least? What? I'm on duty, Rebecca protested. Oh, right, William realized. How about some hot tea then? I won't say no. William poured fragrant, strong tea into cups and placed candies, fruits, and a meat platter on the table. Merry Christmas, Rebecca. He smiled. Merry Christmas, she replied. I have a feeling that the next year will be very interesting. What a surprise I've been given. It's the first time I've seen such a dark-skinned baby. Me too. Can you guess how he ended up here? Yes, I know. William began to tell her about Ruby. Rebecca also remembered that story. She had heard about it from her colleagues. They handed the child over to her back then, but who could have known she would do something like this? There was a loud knock at the door, and the driver entered the house. At last, Rebecca rejoiced. So, is the car ready? Yes. The driver grinned. But can I warm up here for a bit? Of course, William poured another cup of tea. And so, with hot tea and candies, they celebrated Christmas amid quiet conversation. Charlie peacefully slept by the stove, and the baby snored on the couch. William, your place is so cozy, Rebecca smiled. But it's time for us to go. Yes, of course, William sighed. May I ask, do you think they won't return Ruby's child? I hope not. That's unlikely. The driver responded for Rebecca. Now the baby's only option is the orphanage. And to be honest, his future looks tough. Why are you so certain? Rebecca frowned. Maybe things will work out somehow. Do you believe that yourself? The driver smirked. Ordinary kids from the shelter rarely catch a lucky break. And this little one, being of a different race, will likely face even more challenges. Rebecca just sighed. She wrapped the baby in a blanket, with one provided by William. Then, she accompanied the doctor and the driver to the ambulance. Afterward, Sitting by the window and gazing at the starry sky, William remembered the same scene, Rebecca holding the baby, rocking him, and singing. For the first time in years, William suddenly realized what he was missing in life a family. He couldn't forget Rebecca's eyes either so clear, so blue, yet holding a hint of sadness, a secret of their own. The first morning in the forest ranger's house was crowded. An investigative team arrived, along with the local police officer, they took William's statements, examined the Christmas tree, and confiscated the basket in which the baby had been found before departing for Amanda and Ruby's home. William joined them. He was eager to witness how Ruby, who had heartlessly abandoned her child, would react. It turned out that Ruby wasn't at home. Amanda received them in tears and explained that one of Ruby's former admirers had shown up at her daughter's place the previous evening. At first, they had a loud argument. 
but eventually, they reconciled. Ruby had decided to leave town with him. This revelation shocked Amanda. What about the child? She demanded. Ruby simply grimaced. She had no interest in the child or her beloved's desires, but Amanda was insistent. It's your child, so you should raise him. That's when the admirer took the baby and they left in his car. Amanda had spent the entire night crying, realizing that she had given her daughter's child away for no reason. After hearing this, the local police officer assured her that the baby was safe in the hospital. Amanda was initially relieved but then worried about her daughter's whereabouts. We will find her, the investigator reassured her. We have many questions for her. What kind of questions? The woman asked, bewildered. For example, how the child ended up in the woods. In the woods, Amanda gasped and burst into tears once more. The local police officer began consoling her once again, promising that after the investigation, the child could be placed under the grandmother's care. As for Ruby, she would likely lose her parental rights and face legal consequences. Oh my, the woman sobbed, I'm in shock. If you'd like, you can visit the child in the hospital. The investigator said after taking a break from the paperwork, he's fine. The doctors have confirmed. Why would I want to visit him? The woman unexpectedly responded with anger. I don't want to. Let them take him to the orphanage. He's nothing but trouble. Oh, my Ruby. Amanda burst into tears once again. The police officers and the forest ranger looked at her with astonishment. It was evident who her daughter took after. The Po child had turned out to be unwanted by both his mother and grandmother. That was the family dynamic. Ruby and her admirer were apprehended on the same day. They were at a cafe, happy and in love. Ruby had completely forgotten about her child. However, when they pressed her a little at the police station, she suddenly started crying and claimed that her new admirer had convinced her to get rid of the baby. At first, they had considered simply abandoning the baby along the way, but then Ruby suggested leaving him at the doorstep of the forest ranger's cabin. However, she never ventured into the woods herself. The man carried the basket. There was a well-trodden path leading to the cabin, so it was clear where to go. However, he never reached the cabin, instead hiding the baby in the woods, leaving him to a certain death. If it hadn't been for Charlie and his instincts, William might have just passed by. When Ruby learned where her admirer had left the child, she dropped the baby, paled slightly, and then regained her composure, shrugging. But he couldn't have frozen, could he? She said. Why are you all making such a fuss? You're not a woman. You're a monster, the investigator remarked. Ruby cast her eyes down and pursed her lips. She knew that everyone would now condemn her. Why did she need this child anyway? After all, she had wanted to leave him at the maternity hospital. In her mind, it was everyone else's fault but hers. Ruby and her admirer were later put on trial, and they received real prison sentences. But that was a story for another time. For now, in the hospital's pediatric ward, a tiny little boy lay. The entire staff of the ward visited him as if he were an exhibit. Soon, he became the ward's darling. The boy ate well, grew, and was no different from his peers, except for his exotic appearance. They named him Elliot. Ruby hadn't even bothered to give her son a name. Rebecca, the same doctor from the ambulance, visited the baby several times. Interestingly, he fell asleep faster and seemed calm in her arms. Moreover, the baby gazed at Rebecca as if he knew some secret and wanted to tell her something. The young woman felt herself growing more and more attached to the baby with each passing day, and there was nothing she could do about it. After work, she felt drawn to the pediatric ward. There. She changed the baby's clothes, fed him, sang him songs, and reflected on her own life. Three years ago, a tragedy struck Rebecca's life. She was a mother back then. Her son was only six months old when she received a call from the ambulance station, pleading for her to come in as a replacement. It turned out that two paramedics had fallen ill, and there was no one else available for emergency calls. Rebecca, who was on maternity leave at the time, discussed it with her husband. Her husband, Jim, had recently been laid off and was staying at home. They decided that Jim would apply for parental leave to take care of their child, while Rebecca would return to work. The young mother left her son with a responsible husband, who loved their child dearly. On that day, Rebecca had been in a good mood. 
The calls were relatively easy, and her shift would soon be over. Her heart didn't skip a beat when they received a call about a drunk driver who had hit a man with a baby on a pedestrian crossing in the town center. When she got out of the ambulance, her legs almost gave way. In a pool of blood lay her husband, Jim, and their baby. Their son had died on the spot, and Jim passed away a day later. It felt like the earth had stopped, and her heart had turned to stone. She cried like a wild animal for countless nights. She initially considered submitting a voluntary resignation, but the head of the ambulance station convinced her to stay. Rebecca listened to her advice. Indeed, with time, it became more bearable. The pain didn't go away, but it dulled. Rebecca worked tirelessly, showing no regard for herself. She took extra shifts, filled in for colleagues at a moment's notice anything to avoid being at home, where everything reminded her of her husband and son. And so, three years had passed, and she was alone. Rebecca had decided that she would live for her work, but on that Christmas night, something inexplicable happened. No, she had responded to calls involving babies before, but Rebecca had never felt anything like this. As soon as she took this baby into her arms, her heart warmed. Rebecca rocked him gently, singing a song, and she couldn't help but remember her own son. It felt as if he were here, right beside her, against her chest. Of course, Rebecca understood that these were simply untimely emotions, but there was nothing she could do about it. Afterward, she began visiting the hospital, realizing that this little black baby was becoming like family to her. The dejected young woman's state was quickly noticed by the head of the pediatric department. She called her colleague into her office to reprimand her. What are you doing, Rebecca? The head nurse sternly asked. Why are you getting attached to this baby? Well, you know very well that in a month, we have to transfer him to an orphanage. I understand, but I can't help it, Rebecca whispered. I feel drawn to this baby. Rebecca, my dear girl, the head nurse softened her tone. I understand it all. You've endured such a tragedy, but understand, this is not the child you need. You will have your own child someday, but this one, yes, he's a lovely baby, but he's not yours to claim. You must understand. What if I adopt him? Rebecca suddenly revealed her innermost desire. Adopt him. The head nurse's eyes widened. Rebecca, come to your senses. He's dark-skinned. Why would you want that? What difference does his skin color make? He's become like family to me. These are just your emotions. Forget about it. Besides, I doubt they'll allow you to adopt. Your emotional state is unstable. You're alone. And your salary isn't that high. No, it's a futile endeavor. Rebecca, forget about it. Focus on your personal life. Trust me, you can be happy. What about him? Who's he? The head nurse didn't understand. Elliot. And Elliot will be perfectly happy. Just somewhere else. Rebecca didn't argue further. She left the head nurse's office and headed to the child welfare department. There, she heard essentially the same advice she had received from the head of the pediatric department. However, they did give her a list of the required documents for adoption. Rebecca began gathering the necessary paperwork. Her biggest hurdle, she realized, was her single status. On that January day, they coincidentally met at the doors of the pediatric department. Rebecca was leaving after visiting Elliot, while William had finally mustered the courage to visit his godson, as he now referred to the child he had saved. William immediately recognized Rebecca, and for some reason, he felt pleased to see her again. Rebecca, on the other hand, blushed suddenly when she saw William. Are you here for Elliot? Or Rebecca asked. Yeah, I brought him a toy, William said, taking a plush bear out of a bag. But he can't play with toys like that yet. Rebecca shook her head. He's only interested in rattles for now. Really? William said dejectedly. I just like this bear so much. So, where is the little guy? In which room? They said you can go to room 5. Shall we? I'll walk you there. William offered. And they headed to Elliot. The baby was sound asleep. William approached the crib quietly, placed the teddy bear inside, and gazed with interest at the sleeping child. He's so fascinating. William whispered, and he's not really dark-skinned. He's more like chocolate. He will be that way since he was born to different races, Rebecca whispered. I think Elliot will grow up to be a handsome boy. A tear glistened in the corner of her eye. William noticed but tactfully said nothing. They left the room and the department. Both of them were silent. 
How about we grab a coffee and have some cake? William suddenly suggested. Are you in a hurry? I have the day off today, and my husband won't mind. William tried to make a joke while also subtly inquiring about Rebecca's relationship status. Rebecca paled slightly. William realized he had said too much, apologized, and then, sitting in the cafe, Rebecca told him her story. In turn, William confessed that he had spent time in prison and, for the first time in his life, admitted to taking the blame for someone else's sin. For some reason, he wanted Rebecca to know the whole truth. Did you love her that much? Rebecca asked. I did, William admitted. Then I hated her, and now I don't even remember her. Do you regret changing your life so drastically? You lived in the capital, were a businessman, and now you work as a simple gamekeeper in the woods. Not at all. It's only now that I realize I didn't belong there. I was burdened with work, obligations to my father-in-law, to my wife. They all used me, and when things went south, they simply cast me aside. Only afterward did I realize what deceitful people life had brought me. I'm very grateful it ended, William said, then fell silent. Rebecca also fell silent, gazing out the window where snow was falling. Large, fluffy snowflakes danced in the air, landing on houses, trees, and passersby. The scene outside appeared different, as if a new page of life was beginning. William, I want to adopt Elliot, Rebecca suddenly confessed. Do you also think I'm crazy? Don't hold back. Many, if not outright said it, at least hinted at it. I don't think so. For some reason, I've grown fond of that little boy too, William admitted. Whenever I think about him in that basket, my heart skips a beat. Yes, I understand, Rebecca replied absent-mindedly, but they won't allow me to adopt him. I'm single. William suddenly froze, then spoke up. Let's get married, and we'll raise Elliot together. Rebecca was taken aback. She looked at William in surprise and then blushed deeply. But we hardly know each other. We don't love each other, she barely whispered. But that, for now, William also spoke softly. Rebecca became thoroughly embarrassed. She got up and hurried toward the exit. William caught up with her, apologized for his tactlessness, and they parted ways, exchanging phone numbers. A week passed. One morning, William's phone rang, and he heard an anxious female voice. William, is what you said to me in the cafe still valid? Rebecca, is that you? He asked in surprise. Yes, it's about this. In a week, they're taking Elliot to an orphanage, and child welfare won't allow me to adopt him. Just as they said, all because I'm not married. I understand, William replied shortly. Let's meet at the registry office. Don't forget your ID. William jumped into his car and drove off. On the way, he called Michael and asked for his help. As the head of the settlement, he must have had connections in the local administration. So, why do you need to get married in such a hurry? Michael asked. Just like that. I'll explain later. For now, can you help? William replied, I'll do my best. On the same day, Rebecca and William got married and then headed to child welfare. Where do you live? They asked William at child welfare. At my place, Rebecca replied without batting an eyelid. William simply nodded in agreement. But when they left the child welfare office, he whispered to her. They will check, you know. You said you also wanted to raise Elliot, didn't you? Rebecca smiled. Or did you change your mind a William could only smile back, looking somewhat lost? He didn't intend to move so quickly, but circumstances demanded it. Within a couple of days, he had already moved in with Rebecca, bringing Charlie along, who settled in her small house's yard. William now had to spend much more time commuting to work, but he didn't mind at all. For some reason, he felt truly content with Rebecca. Yes, initially, they lived as neighbors, even when they took Elliot in. And a few months later, they suddenly realized that their essentially fake marriage had turned into a real one. Feelings that had slumbered for many years suddenly surfaced in full force, and they became the happiest people on earth. Rebecca was on maternity leave, taking care of Elliot, while William managed his estate, and life flowed smoothly. They never once doubted that they had made the right choice. Their little boy was growing up to be a bright child, delighting them with his achievements. Initially, the people in the village were surprised to see the unusual boy, but soon they got used to him. Elliot was a wonderful child, kind and affectionate. 
Everyone in the neighborhood lovingly called him the chocolate boy. A few years later, William managed to build a new house. Shortly afterward, he received a new position, leading the local gamekeeper's society. Yes, he had changed everything in his life, and he now understood that it was all for the better. His family grew as well. When Elliot was three, Rebecca gave birth to a daughter, Jessica, and a year later, a son named James. Elliot, as the eldest brother, helped his mother, keeping an eye on his little sister and brother. When Elliot was about seven years old, just before starting school, he asked for the first time why he looked different. Rebecca and William decided not to hide his birth story from him. Of course, they didn't mention that his birth mother had abandoned him in the cold, and his biological grandmother had practically rejoiced in getting rid of him. No, they simply explained to Elliot that another woman had given birth to him from a different race, but he was still their beloved child. One day, the entire family went on a vacation to the seaside. They had a few hours in the capital city, so the parents decided to treat the children to a small excursion. Elliot was 10 years old by then, Jessica was 7, and James was 6. They were old enough to understand and be curious about many things. After the tour, they stopped at a cafe for a snack. It was there that William saw his first wife. At first, he didn't recognize her. She had changed significantly, sitting there looking somewhat disheveled, dressed cheaply, sipping her coffee. But then, their eyes met by chance. Yes, she had changed, but her eyes were the same, gray and seemingly transparent. Emma was the first to recognize him. She twitched, paled, seemed like she wanted to leave, but then she got up and headed towards their table. Hello, she simply said. Long time no see. Is this your family? Rebecca looked at her in surprise, then at William. He remained silent, searching for the right words, tempted to be rude, although he wanted to avoid it. Yes, this is my family, he calmly replied. I see, Emma smirked. In this one too, she casually gestured towards Elliot. The boy understood everything and hung his head in disappointment. William had no intention of tolerating such rudeness any longer. He's my eldest son, he replied, barely holding back his anger. And as for you, it seems life hasn't been kind. It's all fine with my life, Emma retorted and walked away. Rebecca continued to look at her husband with surprise. William, who is she? She asked quietly. That's the one who I thought ruined my life before but it turns out she ruined her own. He replied thoughtfully, watching Emma walk away. She went to the counter, exchanged a few words with the bartender, and left. And you described her differently. Rebecca couldn't find the right words. Well, in short, as a socialite. But here, she seems like an ordinary woman. I'm shocked myself. William admitted, I hadn't been following her life or her father's. But now, you know, I became curious. I might go ask the bartender something. And soon, for a small fee, the bartender shared Emma's story with William. It turned out that she had been working as a dishwasher in this cafe. Recently, she had been fired for not handling her duties properly. However, she continued to come here, hoping to be rehired. Amazing, William remarked. I knew her as someone entirely different. Wealthy, successful. Well, that was in her past life. The bartender chuckled. I've heard a bit about it. He recounted that Emma's father had suddenly passed away. Her husband managed to take control of the entire business, leaving her with nothing. Later, he divorced her, taking their mansion as well. Yes, she was a lawyer herself, but her education had been funded by her father, so she didn't really understand much about the profession. At first, Emma didn't grasp the seriousness of the situation. She indulged herself spent her last money, and one day, her bank account ran wry. Soon after, friends and acquaintances disappeared, and her lover abandoned her. She started drinking, lived in a small apartment, which she eventually had to sell. She couldn't find a decent job, so she worked as a waitress, a cleaner, and even a dishwasher. With years passing by, her looks faded, and she lost her figure. Now she was just an ordinary woman, like many others in the world. William listened and realized he felt nothing, no anger, no joy. It turned out he was entirely indifferent to whatever had happened to Emma. After their family enjoyed a wonderful vacation by the sea, they returned to their village and life went on. William no longer remembered his encounter with his first wife. 
He had his own concerns and responsibilities, but fate had another meeting in store for his family. One autumn day, they all went for a family walk in the forest to relax and gather mushrooms. The forest was enchanting, and they returned with a basket full of mushrooms. On the way back, William suggested that Rebecca and the kids wait in the car while he quickly cleared the grass from his parents' graves. You and the kids can wait in the car, and I'll quickly mow the grass at the graves, he said. I'll help you too, Dad, to clean up at Grandpa and Grandma's graves, Elliot replied. William nodded in agreement and smiled. A real helper was growing up. Leaving Rebecca with Jessica and James in the car, William and Elliot headed to the graves. They tidied up in just 10 minutes and turned to head back. Suddenly, William noticed a woman near a fresh grave, next to the fence. Not recognizing her, he silently walked past her, but then he heard her scream. William, the gamekeeper, is that you? It was Ruby, looking thin and haggard. She approached them, wearing a silly smile. Oh, it's definitely you, she exclaimed. Look at how important you've become, and who's this? She paused for a moment, swayed, and then smiled again. My boy. Yes, this is my son, William replied, taking Elliot's hand and picking up the pace. Hey, where are you going? Ruby shouted, can't we talk? Why are you so unfriendly? I wanted to tell you about my misfortunes. My mom just passed away. I barely made it to her funeral. But William didn't listen to her. He practically ran away from there put his son in the car, got in himself, and started the engine. Why are you so agitated? Rebecca asked in surprise when she saw Ruby coming out of the gates. Who is she? William didn't answer. He just shook his head as if to say they would talk about it later. That's some drunk woman, Elliot added. Back at home that evening, after the children had gone to sleep, William explained who he had seen at the cemetery. So, they released her from prison, Rebecca sighed but it was to be expected. Let her live her own life. The main thing is that she doesn't bother us or meddle with Elliot, William replied, but he have hoped in vain. The very next day, Ruby appeared in the district village and found William's house. William happened to be at work. Elliot and Jessica were at school and Rebecca had come home after her shift, planning to prepare lunch quickly and then get some rest. Suddenly, there was a loud knocking at the gate. Old Charlie, Though hard of hearing, still managed to hear the commotion and grew concerned. Rebecca went out to see who was causing the disturbance. Standing at the gate was the woman she had seen at the cemetery. Are you the gamekeeper's wife? The guest asked impudently. Yes, I am. What do you want? Rebecca replied calmly. Ah, I see. So, you're the one who took my son. Ruby stated. Took, or rescued when you abandoned him in the cold, with your lover. Rebecca retorted. Quit the smart talk. Ruby snapped, her breath heavy with alcohol. He's my son, and I did as I pleased with him. According to the documents, he's my son and Williams. Leave before I call the police. Rebecca raised her voice. I'm not afraid of them. Ruby chuckled. But if you don't want your older son to worry, you and your gamekeeper better gather some money for me. I only need $5,000. What? Are you trying to extort money from us? Rebecca laughed. No, I'm just offering you a deal. Pay me, and I won't disrupt your older son's fragile psyche. Otherwise, I'll approach him on the street. I'll tell him I'm his mother, just like that. Yes, I used to be a beauty once. What do you think? Your little boy will be pleased to meet his real mommy. Probably cried ears of joy. Ruby taunted. Get lost. You won't get a cent from us. Besides, Elliot already knows that we're not his biological parents. Rebecca replied firmly. He may know, but he'll be impressed when he sees his real mommy. Ruby persisted, ignoring Rebecca's stern tone. However, Rebecca had no more desire to converse with this fallen woman. She closed the door and walked back into the yard. After preparing lunch, Rebecca headed to the school to pick up the children. Normally, they would come home on their own, but today she was feeling anxious. What if this woman was unstable and decided to approach her older son? Meeting his biological mother wouldn't do Elliot's mood any favors, that was for sure. Rebecca waited until Jessica and Elliot walked out of the school gates. Mom, why are you picking us up today? Elliot asked, surprised. I can walk Jessica home myself. I just wanted to. Rebecca smiled. Why aren't you resting? You should be sleeping right now. 
Elliot scolded Rebecca as if he were the adult. You're such a good kid. Rebecca smiled and said, I promise I'll sleep next time. For now, let's go home. I made your favorite soup. She hugged the children, and all three of them walked home together. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed Ruby near the school. It seemed she was indeed determined to upset Elliot. What should they do about her? That evening, Rebecca told William everything. Why on earth would we start paying her? William raised an eyebrow. Elliot knows perfectly well that we're not his biological parents. You can't hide such a difference in appearance. She's not focusing on that, you see. She realizes that our son is growing up in a stable environment. He's doing well, and he has friends at school. And then suddenly, this homeless woman shows up, trying to instill a sense of inadequacy in him. Rebecca explained. What a scoundrel. William cursed. So maybe we should just tell Elliot everything ourselves. I don't know how he'll take it. We always told him that his mother simply abandoned him, but we didn't tell him she left him out in the cold, let alone that she went to prison for it, Rebecca replied. Yes, he's still quite young to know the whole truth. William agreed. And not at all young, they suddenly heard their son's voice. It turned out that Elliot had gotten up to have some water and had overheard their conversation. William and Rebecca were left stunned, like children. Mom, Dad, I don't care who gave birth to me, or how that woman is living now. Elliot calmly said, I understand why she abandoned me, as you say, I'm different, not white. So what? You love me. That's what matters. The boy walked over and hugged his parents, and they sighed with relief. It turns out they had such a mature and sensible son. Ruby approached Elliot the very next day when he and his sister were returning from school. Hello, Elliot, she said to the boy. Do you know that I'm the one who gave birth to you? Elliot looked attentively at the disheveled woman and shrugged. You, well, now I'll know what betrayal looks like. He said it differently and went on his way, tightly holding his little sister's hand. Ruby remained standing on the road, bewildered by what this bold young boy had just told her. Then she shook her head and walked away. Did she regret her actions from many years ago? Apparently not. For her, Elliot was just a mistake. Too bad she couldn't make some money off that mistake. A few days later, she was found near her mother's grave. She had consumed some toxic substance and passed away. William told his elder son about it because he realized there was no need to hide anything from those you love. Elliot had already graduated from high school and enrolled in college to study international relations. Jessica and James missed their brother terribly and always looked forward to his visits home. William and Rebecca were proud of all their children, especially the eldest. After all, it was this boy who once united their hearts. Thanks to him, they realized that outward appearances didn't matter so much. What counted was what was inside a person. If they lived with joy and love for their loved ones, then no life's twists and turns could frighten them. With the support of their loved ones, they could overcome anything and emerge victorious.